This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. For her years of work as an attorney, a feminist, an author, and member of the bench, Emily Jane Goodman was recently honored by her peers as the people's advocate and a judicial visionary. As a civil court judge for three years and a Supreme Court justice for more than 20 years, her rulings reflect her passionate commitment to the pursuit of justice, sometimes earning the ire of mayors and the enmity of the New York Daily News and the New York Post, but the respect and appreciation of many more. And she's my guest today. So you're what we called an activist judge? In a good way. In a good way. <laughs> it's true, because these other guys who complain about activist judges are activist are judges. Act yeah. yeah, yeah, the Supreme Court, yeah. United States Supreme Court judges. Right. So what does it mean to activist? be an activist? Yeah. Well, I don't know how they mean it. Yeah, I mean, But the way I mean it, it is that uh, my commitment was to finding the way to do the right thing, finding the way to do justice. And that can be difficult, because uh, you do have to operate within the framework of what the law is. But that has to be tempered also with um, justice. And, uh, you know, interestingly, there's a, a, sub, a, a lot of talk going on right now I think since um, the president mentioned wanting federal judges who are empathetic, he hasn't been using that word anymore. But now the question <laughs> is whether it's judges are empathetic, can be empathetic. And uh, I would say that empathy is one of the things that is activist, uh, that you really relate to what people are going through, what they are suffering. And in, in our courts, I think it's getting worse and worse because the economy gets worse, people's lives are harder, so you see m more and more human problems. It's a whole different thing if it's commercial. You know, it's a different thing if, if IBM is suing Microsoft, uh, uh, clearly. Um, but people are in court with problems that really cannot be solved. Uh, not, not not in the courts, not by judges, not by juries, like what? really. Well, uh, housing is a big thing. Uh, I'm working on a case right now as a pro bono thing where uh, a uh, NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, uh, is trying to evict a woman under the following circumstances. She is in her 70s, and uh, she is physically and mentally impaired. Well, she's been married for over 30 years, but for most of the time, she and her husband really didn't live together. Um, they had a child who's now, of course, an adult, but um, in 19, I mean, in 2010, uh, she went to live with him in his apartment in public housing. And they're getting old, they are old, he's a lot older than she, and they had a commitment to taking care of each other in their old age. So as it happened, he died first. Now she's uh -huh. being evicted, or they're seeking to evict her because he had not put her name down uh, as an occupant of the apartment, and therefore he never got permission for her to live there, even though they she's his wife. And most people would assume that a spouse, you know, our society makes a very big deal about marriage. So right. you would think that a spouse was in a separate category than someone else. Um, and that kind of thing is not uh, unusual. There are terrible, terrible cases involving public housing. Uh, that, that's, that's one example where the institution is not really that involved with human lives, in my opinion. So it is that empathy that I, I think that's a, I think that is a very big factor, and uh, so it means understanding also that if something's written as an as a 
a rule if, if it doesn't make sense? Well, naturally, everything has to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. Because if things didn't have to be interpreted, you could just have computers making mm -hmm. the decision. And the computer could say, if, if this, then that. So everything has to be interpreted. So and are you unusual in having being as empathetic as you are on the bench? Well, I, I'm certainly not, not the only one. Uh, but uh, if you consider that you are the product of your life, and you see things in a certain way. Um, not with Thomas Clarence, uh, Clarence Thomas notwithstanding, uh, I would say if, you know, if you've had a hard life uh, or not a privileged life, you do see what other people mm -hmm. are going through. And if as, a, why be a judge unless you are a person who's going to try your best to do the right thing for people? Who needs you otherwise? That's, that's what I so think. So one of the questions I'm, I'm so interested in is, how do people become who they are? No? How do people become judges? No, just oh. who they are. How do you, where did you get your sense of wanting to have justice in the world, for instance? How, where did that come from? Well, I suppose, I mean, I grew up in a very working class family in Brooklyn. Um, I wasn't ever supposed to go to college. Um, no girls in my family went to college. No one thought it was necessary. And uh, I went to college at night and worked during the day. And that just came naturally, that, that drive to do that. That's a big accomplishment. Yes, well, because I graduated from high school and I was just 16 and I looked around and I said, is this all there is? Now I'm gonna be in the typing pool for the rest of my life. So uh, that was not a good idea, so I walked across the street from my high school, which was Midwood in Brooklyn. I walked across the street to Brooklyn College <laughs> and started college. But uh, it did take about six years going at night. It's incredible, because that's an accomplishment. I mean, when I go to some of these places and I see people who are working during the day and going to school at night, it's, it's something, I don't know if it's really appreciated outside of what their accomplishment well, is. Well, it's hard because it means that uh, you're not there just to have fun yeah. and live in a dorm right. and nice. go out drinking. You're really there because yeah. you want to go to college. Yeah. But you don't, you don't have the experience of you know, a campus yeah. and all of that, although Brooklyn College has a very pretty campus. So then you went to law school right after that? No, then I worked. But then too, I realized, <laughs> is this all there is? Again, because uh, I, then I discovered that Everybody had a BA in English literature, <laughs> and I was interested in working in publishing, editing, et cetera, but I would, again, be a secretary. So I, uh, I had a job at the New York Times as a secretary, and then I saw that the guys who worked there as copy boys could become reporters. Isn't that me? I was at CBS, was the same thing. Okay, so, <laughs> but, but all the secretaries were women. They could become assistants. If, if they got any place, right? Uh, well, as far yeah. as I could see, you could only <laughs> rise to being the secretary to a higher level mm -hmm. editor, but you'd still be a secretary. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't give you a shot at being a reporter or um, <laughs> an editor. So I decided I should go to graduate school and I focused on law school or journalism school. And I, I'd go to whichever I got into first. So I went to law school, but then I also went to Columbia Graduate yeah, School so of Journalism. Both. So I, I do have both. So you were just very smart. I mean, you really oh, worried well, about your future. I worried about my future because um, I wanted a life that was interesting and fulfilling and meaningful and useful. Mm -hmm. As Marge Piercy has written, you know, to be of use. Yeah. It's important, yeah. So did the bench being a judge or a justice, uh, did that fulfill, did, was that what you thought it was gonna be like? Yes and no. You know, it's a very lonely, isolating job. I'm sure mm. you know that, but I think the public thinks that a judge is a very powerful person who just sits there and tells other people what to do. But that isn't the case. For some it might be, but I, I did not find that to be what my job was. I felt that my job was to do justice. And so that's not uh, that's that's the hard part. I mean, I, as I said before, you, if you care about what happens in people's lives, 
how you're going to get there is is a big challenge. Plus, there isn't a lot of support in that direction from the administration, the court administration, or the city, because everything now is about um, volume, <coughs> statistics, and justice is very elusive. It's about get the get get the case over. Just sign off on that. Keep it moving. Just keep things moving. So you moving. can take the next case. <laughs> right, next case, next case. And it's kind of, it, it's a big, very big bureaucracy now. And uh, you're on kind of a conveyor belt. And uh, in certain ways, it's much harder on the civil side than criminal. Because in criminal, and it, this week is the anniversary of um, the decision of, of 50 years ago, uh, uh, requiring uh, counsel in criminal cases, but that's not true in civil cases, although the chief judge is very um, committed to having representation in civil cases, but, but that doesn't exist. So on the, on the criminal side, you know at least, for better or for worse, the accused has a lawyer. On the civil side, not so. Mm. And where you see that, uh, I mean, I haven't been in uh, uh, civil court for many years, but for example, in uh, housing court, landlord-tenant, all the landlords, or maybe 95% of the landlords are represented by lawyers, and almost no tenants ever are. So they're kind of on their own. They don't know what's going on. They, they make agreements that they will never be able to understand or, or yeah. live up to. Terrible. Did you, and the Supreme Court, do you handle both cases, both civil and? Well, I did criminal for quite a few years, then I switched over to civil. In most courts, you do both. Mm. Um, but in Manhattan, you're really doing one or the other. Partially, I think, because of the volume and also the way the buildings are constructed. So the <laughs> building that everybody knows, the one that's on law and order, <laughs> has no jail facilities. So they can't really. So that's civil. So it's civil, they can't really do criminal cases there. Plus, I think it's different unions. Uh, um, and older. so uh, I, I have always wished that we were doing both or that we could switch up and back maybe every year yeah. or so. But well, that we, happen. we skipped over all the years that you were not a judge in between being a lawyer and a journalist and, and the fact that you were really a, an advocate for many things at a women's law center. And you always, were, were you always sympathetic to women? <laughs> it's so interesting to me. You did well, a lot of matrimonial stuff? As a lawyer? Yeah. I did, yeah, because when I became a lawyer, it was 1968. You remember 1968. Everything was happening. Yeah. And it was a great time to be a woman lawyer because suddenly women were saying that they wanted to be represented by women. Yeah. Which didn't exist before because there were hardly any women, women lawyers. Right. And uh, so that made a very big difference. But I saw in my own life, uh, you know, as, as I said before, a girl didn't have to go to college. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 so I um, was very early on aware that uh, a traditional role would not work for me. I w would not find any fulfillment in that. Well, it took enough. years for me to realize that because my traditional role for my generation was you go to college, you get a job for a couple of years, you get married, and you have children. Well, mm -hmm. what happens after your children grow up or after you have them? You know, no, there was nothing there for me. Yeah, well, but of course, you have done everything. But it was all serendipitous. I never planned it like yeah. you did. You, I you were smart I, enough to know it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't think about children, really. Yeah. And then I was already, um, you know, past 40 when I started to think about that. And you remember there were T-shirts right. that uh, women had that said, oops, I forgot to have children. <laughs> uh, because then and now there was always the question of how could you do everything? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but I, did, I did catch the mood in time. And you had a and daughter. I, and I have my daughter. Yeah. And, um, and I'm very happy that, that I didn't right, miss that right. experience. It's incredible. So what would you do for the courts now? What would you do for people who find themselves in court? Well, there, there does need to be a way to have lawyers for pro se or self-represented litigants. The, the law is just too complex. But there's the funding. It, it yeah. doesn't exist. You know, there are 
cutbacks in everything, as, as you well know. And uh, so it's a very bad time to even contemplate Adding. that that there would be a, um, a right to counsel. It's incredible. But, it's really incredible, isn't it, that you don't have that. And it's very hard to find any, <clears throat> I mean, legal aid or something to handle that kind of stuff. Well, legal aid keeps being cut back, too. Yeah. And they have fewer and fewer people and larger and larger volumes of people who need help. You, um, you were quite outspoken about salaries. <laughs> yes. Did they ever increase the salary? This uh, past year, uh, there was an increase. Um, it, was, it was quite insulting because, uh, though you might say it was better than nothing, but the, law, the judges had set at a minimum, we should be paid the same as federal judges. You know, the state court judges do much more work than the federal judges and uh, have a much greater volume. So, and what was the salary? The going salary was well. Well, for the last thirteen years, it had not gone above. It was one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars, uh, and it, it 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 was stagnating. Uh, the uh, uh, you know your rent went up, but your salary yeah. didn't. Right. So a commission was established, and um, unfortunately, the commission w wouldn't just give the judges or make the recommendation that the judges should get the same salary they said over a three-year period. So that's where it, where it is. There was some increase last year. But you year. weren't making as much as a, as a member of the assembly, were you? I don't think. Um, Certainly not as a member. No, no, they get, they get less, but, but they, they can don't do work. They work part-time. They work part-time and... I don't think they get they that much. And they can have other careers. But they don't get that much less at all, I don't think. Well, not when they get uh, uh, committee chairs yeah. and their per right. diem and their expenses and all are that. all paid and everything else. But if they're lawyers, they can have law practices or yeah. their accountants or whatever. But lawyers could yeah. not do anything. And you had young, couldn't. you had lawyers appearing before you. A young lawyer in a law firm is making what? Three hundred. Well, two hundred. I don't know uh, how much they make. These. They were starting at about one hundred and sixty-five thousand, one hundred close to two hundred thousand for a lawyer which, just out of law school. Right, which is a lot more than than the judge. Yeah. It's interesting because we have great respect for judges, and yet they're paid less. I mean, if you relate it like to teachers who have this important role in a, in a person's life, but don't seem to have the respect for their position. That's right. It's, it's the other way with a judge. Well, well, for one thing about teachers, as we know, most teachers have been women. Right. So the job is devalued, and uh, it's you know, people used to say in Russia, oh, doctors are women. Yeah. But it was not really a highly respected position. position. See, I think what's happened in the courts, though, is that when all the judges, uh, or almost all of the judges, were older white men, uh, they had the run of the show. But as the demographics changed, and women came in, and gay people, and people of color, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, this bureaucracy sat on top of the judges and had to be monitored. And I do think it's because, who are these people? You know, we're, we're outsiders to the traditional yeah. so court structure. That's the way I have always seen it. And I do think that that has interfered with the independence of the judiciary. That's so interesting. That's, and now, more and more law students are women, right? Yes just when they can't get jobs. Right, <laughs> naturally. So now the field is to become a hedge fund operator or go to Wall Street. Well, so it's all money. It comes down to all money. It's money. If it's money, you've got power. If it's money, you must be smart. You know, that's my whole thing that I well, can't stand. <laughs> so now, what are you going to do to fulfill this drive and Well, I'm, you, you know, I've left the bench, and uh, <coughs> I served almost 30 years. So I feel like, you know, I did my time. And, so, and now I'm, I'm practicing law. And I think that's a much better thing to do than to retire. I wouldn't know what to do if you I can't retire. It's retired. <laughs> um, and so I have interesting issues to deal with. And, but I, I also have to support myself because all those years that we didn't get a pay increase and I'm living in, in New York City in Manhattan, I incurred a lot of debt. And, uh, you know, I had my daughter in college and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I have to keep working. 
but I think even if I didn't well, have want to, to, I think I, it's I would important. Want, I would want yeah, to. Yeah. Do you um, do you think that? Uh, and you've you've done so many interesting things. Are you writing now? Uh, I am writing, but uh, but I'm not writing enough. And now I really have to get in touch with editors. And as you know, there are fewer and fewer outlets and fewer publications. And uh, and what and online? Online, uh, there you are. You're doing Co Gotham Gazette. What, what? I did Gotham Gotham Gazette for ten years, uh, every month. Right. And that was really interesting. But a new editor came in. They changed the format and so on. So I don't do uh, Gotham Gazette anymore. Um, and so I, I have, and I, I write occasionally for the Nation and uh, and other publications. But I have to build it up because now I'm much freer. I can say to what talk I about. want to say. So what do you want to say? Tell me in order. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, all the things that I couldn't talk about for years, I want to be able to take public positions on things. Um, List them. Okay. Well, I've gotten maybe not necessarily in this order, but I've gotten very interested recently in the issue of uh, condoms, where, you know, they're allowing into evidence possession of condoms as evidence of prostitution which is very contrary to the public health position. Right, exactly. Yeah. So who decides that? Who made that? The legislature. The legislature. Yeah. So in other words, it, it, it's, it may also be part of the, you know, uh, stop and frisk thing. You're searched and you have condoms in your bag. You're a prostitute. Right. And apparently that's uh, hitting the, the transgender and gay communities a lot. Um, I've always been passionate about housing. And you know, uh, my last case as a judge, I would not leave until I finished that case, involved uh, Williamsburg and so-called affordable housing, <laughs> uh, where the, the different uh, groups had been in, in combat for years. On one side, the Hasidic Jewish community, and on the other side, everybody else. <laughs> and uh, so the city had, and the city council had uh, reduced the height of residential buildings so it wouldn't be more than, I think, six or seven stories, where previously it was industrial, it could be higher. And, uh, you know, the Hasidic uh, community, in, in observing their, the, the Sabbath, they don't ride in elevators, so they didn't really want tall buildings. The other communities said, well, make it a tall building and we'll live on the higher floors. We'll take the elevators. But that was not working out. Um, and in the end, I found that um, w w there was an extensive hearing and uh, the city fought this bitterly. Um, I mean, the city was in favor of it. The city was supporting this housing. Huh. Uh, and. Uh, the thing was that I did find that they had failed to consider the racial implications and that therefore this project would further segregation in New York City rather than integration. Mm. So now the unfortunate thing is it's just kind of stagnant mm -hmm. and I don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. But that was my last case that they could not go forward on that basis. So do you feel you're going to have more ability to um to affect more lives rather than individual people who are there in court by being outside or? Well, it depends what cases yeah. I get. Yes, because uh, if it's a big, yeah, you, you that's know. true. That was a silly question. Well, I don't, it's not a silly question, but I can't just go out and, you know, find the people and find the, uh, the issues. Um, but, I mean, some cases are just regular legal legal matters uh, like yeah. I'm very interested in prenup agreements and I know that's controversial a lot of people think they're, they're <laughs> not it's not romantic right. <laughs> but I think it's a very good idea because I think marriages are in part economic partnerships now mm -hmm. and I don't think you can disguise that in in mm -hmm. romance alone uh, you know, as, as, as I have been saying, the only thing that's permanent is a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> so are you glad you were a judge? I am glad I was a judge. I, uh, it, was, it was good for me. It was a great way to raise a child. Uh, 
because my my work could yeah. be uh, organized as I yeah. as I needed to organize it. Um, I think I made a difference in people's lives, but it is frustrating because there's only so much you can do, and you never know how it all turns out. You see a sliver of somebody's life or family or a group, and then they're gone. You don't know what happened. If you're a novelist, you write. Mm -hmm. how, how it will all turn mm -hmm. out and what the end will be. Nobody comes back to tell you Nobody what happened. Nobody ever tells you. That's they don't bad. send you pictures. And Is that say, because they don't think you're a human, you're a judge? <laughs> they ju it's over. Yeah. I, I, you don't know. You, you, you never know. So that, for me, is one of the right. frustrating things. I wonder whatever happened to <laughs> so and so. That's, right. Maybe you could find out on the internet now. <laughs> but what's, what struck me before, and we're just at the end of this program, is the more democratic the composition of the judges is, the less uh, ability the individual judges have to. That's my do what analysis they think. of it. Uh, I don't I think I I haven't heard anybody else speak about mm -hmm. it that way. But but it all coincided. The the bureaucracy is is enormous. So interesting. Well, Emily Jane Goodman, we were lucky to have you oh, on the bench. Oh, thank you, Ronnie. It's and, always good to and see I, you. And many years of more successes and, and causes and, and courage and everything Well, we're else. in this together. Right, we are. <laughs> For how long, I don't know, but we are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.